the midnight cry. Yes. You know, a gentleman came and gave us a vision he had last night, and that's one thing he saw. Yes. Were the saints coming out of the grave. Glory. Brothers and sisters, that's why we've been here. Yes. Because we want everybody to come up out of the grave or to be alive waiting for their Savior. Awesome. Amen. No yes. regrets. It'll be too late then. Yes. Where will you spend eternity? Amen. I have been so blessed. We've been blessed. And I still feel been like blessed. there's more and there's still water in that baptismal oh tank. Oh, my. Come on, honey. I believe there's still more. Amen. In fact, I was thinking about taking his robe off for myself. Bless you, honey. Bless you. The Lord has been good. Amen. Those of you who have come out and supported us and loved us so much. Yes. You have loved you. us so much. It has been a blessing. It, it has. has been a blessing because we see the movement of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We have one more message to give through God's power and His grace this morning. And I pray that you're hungry. Amen. And I pray that you're thirsting. Because if you are, you'll be filled. Praise the Lord. Let Hallelujah. us kneel where we can. Great and mighty God in heaven. Oh, Holy Father, when you tell your son to go get your children, mm. I pray that every soul will be mm. ready. Yeah. I pray that we'll be ready. That our children, our grandchildren will be ready. Amen. Father, speak to us one more time. Give the power, the electrical power mm, of the Holy amen. Spirit to your manservant today. Praise. That's all we are, servants. We're nothing. That's right. Just servants. But God, as you see fit, I pray you'll speak through this vessel. Amen. That Help you'll speak Lord. words of life. Words that will convict, words that will convert, yes. words that will set this church on fire, oh, glory. absolutely on fire yes. for Jesus Christ. Yes. May it not be the same after today we Thank pray you. in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Oh, boy, happy Sabbath, church. I tell you, I'm having a happy day. Joy in the Lord, isn't that right? Oh, I just, you know, I think I'm going to preach a while and cry a while. Then I'll preach some more, and then I'll cry some more. Is that all right? That's how it comes out of your heart, isn't it? It's all right, so, you know, if we have to, we not we shed a few tears, it's, it's tears of joy and happiness of the God that we serve today. We, I'll, I'll be conscious of the time. I told you I made the first night or two that I got here. I, I asked you the question. You remember? What does it mean when a pastor puts his, his watch up here? You know what it means? Nothing. <laughs> I've seen him do it. That we need to be conscious certainly of the time and of the saints. And a big program this afternoon that we're looking forward to. A lot of good music and a lot of good testimonies. If you want your heart continued to stay on the plane of heaven, you'll, you'll really want to attend because you'll meet the other three ABN personnel that's in other churches if you hadn't had a chance to do that already. Ready? And uh, some of the, those who are baptized in the cause of Christ. And It's just going to be a good, good time together. I, I think they'll be filming a lot of it. And taking some testimonies and different things. So it just sounds like a good time to me. And uh, we'll look forward, hopefully, to seeing you there. You have your Bibles with you. It's always good to carry our Bible. Realize we have a lot of stuff on the screen, but bless their hearts. They have a hard time staying up with me because I skip a lot. Sometimes you do that, you know. You just have to let the Holy Spirit do the leading and the guiding. We'll talk a little bit for a few moments today. So I'm conscious of the time, and I really am. You've been so patient, so kind, and good, and I, I appreciate it so very much. Uh, I always get my hand out and hope you got your little hand out with you. That way you can take it home and I always say, check the preacher. He may not be telling you the truth because every preacher don't tell the truth. 
that okay? Say that. I get funny looks sometimes, like people say, well, you shouldn't say it. Well, it's it either truth or it's not. Every preacher's not telling you the truth. In fact, the majority of them are not. But it's not harmonizing with Scripture here the way I see it. So I'm not trying to criticize or condemn them, but we need to be going to church to where we know we're hearing the truth. I can't stand to sit and listen to things that's untruth, what I believe is untruth. It's just like somebody sticking me with a knife. That, Ooh, I just can't stand it. Where's the car and radio? Where am I turned off quick? I don't waste my time on it because I need to hear what truth is. I need to fortify truth in my heart and my life. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Sorry, Jeffrey, that's the first one that wasn't even on your list. I'll start him out right. It's actually one of my favorite passages, and I'll say that from time and time again, but I like this because it talks about the second coming of Jesus. Because as a people, we should be, what's the first word? Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So I pray today, it seems as such that we are looking for that glorious hope. We're looking. We're anticipating something big is about to happen. Something that's exciting, life-changing. This world will not be like it's always been because Jesus is on the horizon. He's getting ready to come, and he's putting things in order. And we need to come to order. We need to come to attention because the king is speaking. And when he speaks from his word, we need to thank him for it. I'm looking for that blessed hope. That's what the second coming is to me. We cover a few areas as we can the time that we have, but I just simply put here, there's no other event in human history that measures up to this, the coming of Jesus. I mean, what else can you think that would top the coming of Jesus Christ? Would it be anything? Can you think of anything in the world that would top the coming of Jesus Christ? I can't think of anything. There's four Bible passages that I want us to look at, and they're probably not on your list, Brother Jeffrey. I'm so sorry. I'm about to blow my nose. You forgive me. These passages are vital for who, those who say they love Jesus. Now, remember, you say you love Jesus. These passages are vital. We need to understand why. Isaiah chapter 28 Isaiah chapter 28, 9 and 10. You will know most of these, I'm sure, but I want to remind you of these. We start talking about this blessed hope because when I start talking about the blessed hope, I will get a little bit excited because I can't help myself. And I'm sure some of you get a little bit excited because it's a message you've heard over and over and over, but how beautiful it is each time. It gets more beautiful to me to think about the coming of Jesus. And you don't have to be an older person. You can be a young person and still think, oh, yes, I want him to come. But I don't want to be selfish. I want others to be ready, too, for his coming. The book, the Bible, Isaiah 28, 9 and 10 says, now we're talking about finding truth. So all during this series, we're saying we're looking for truth, aren't we? We want to find truth. And people say, how do you find truth? Well, the Bible even defines that for us, how we can know what truth is. It says, whom shall he teach knowledge? Good question, verse 9. And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Hmm. Them that are weaned from the, the milk and drawn from the breast. And, of course, verse 10 is more familiar. We read from Scripture. It says, for precept must be what? On precept. And notice how it's repeated. Precept upon precept. And then it says line upon line. And then what? Line upon line. Oh, boy. A little here and a little there. So you find truth by doing what? Searching the scriptures, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little bit, there a little bit, and see what every Bible writer has to say on that subject, and you'll have the truth. Yeah. Don't be like many of the, the, you know, the, the pastors and different ones today. They'll get one, one Bible passage, and that's, what, that's all they use. Yeah. And then they just go any direction they want to go. But to prove what is the truth, you have to look at what every Bible writer has to say on that subject. Then you'll know that you have the truth because they'll all harmonize. And then, of course, 1 John 2, verse 6. 1 John 2, verse 6, very powerful because we're saying today, I'm abiding in Christ. 
The world says, I'm abiding in Christ. The world says, I love Jesus. You know what I'm talking about, but the professed Christian world. We love Jesus. We don't need anything. We're happy where we're at. We're happy. We don't need any changes, really. Are we abiding in Christ? Notice what the scripture says. He that saith he what? Abideth in him ought himself also to walk as he walked. That's going to tell whether you're abiding. Whether you're lying to yourself, teasing yourself, or whatever it might be, the Bible makes it very clear. If we say we abide in him, then we must walk the way he walked. If you're not walking the way he walked, that means talking, that means what? His teachings, his doctrines, the examples that he set. We're fooling ourselves. And I do believe we're that close to the coming of Jesus. We should have been doing this all along. In the history of Adventism, people say, well, it's about time. No, it's way past time. We should have ever been in the kingdom by now. We should have been in the kingdom by now. There's plenty of evidence given to support that. If we had done the right things. So now we're looking up and saying, God, time is short. We want to do the right things. But I have to walk the way that he walked. And 2 Thessalonians 2, 10, 9 and 10 uh, very familiar too, talks about, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, notice this, I'm going to focus on this part only, because they receive not, a what? Because they receive not a love of the truth that they might be saved. Truth and being saved has something that's good, good. do you see it? Those who are going to be saved will be saved because they know what truth is, because truth changes the heart and changes the life. Right? The soul feeds on that. It doesn't feed on error. It shouldn't. Error can't save you. A lie can't save you. Mom and dad can't save you. Grandma and grandpa can't save you. It's your relationship with Jesus Christ. We have to come to love the truth that we might be saved. Think about it. To love the truth means you like to be around it. That means you're, we're going to be attending church. That means we're not going to be absent every other week. Are you still with me, church? Well, I hear someone say, yeah, with you. Well, the proof of that will be if you're here every week, right? If you're not, then you're just talking too. Now, I know no one's like that here, so I'm just, I'm just talking straight with you and just bringing some things out so we can have a discussion. Yeah, if the doors are open, we're going to want to be here because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Hearing the Word of God has taught me over the years that Jesus is coming. His glorious appearing is just around the corner. And I've often said, if I miss that, I've missed my purpose for being here. There's no reason for me to be here if there wasn't something hereafter. Think about it. If this, if this is all life has to you know, offer us, it's, it's a bad trick that's been played on us. Think about it. If there's nothing after this life, what a mess. I'm banking on it. I'm counting on it because Jesus said, I, I go to prepare a place for you is our passage. You remember that? And then the Bible says in Acts chapter 5, verse 29. Acts 5, verse 29. says, Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, Ooh, I like this. What? We ought to obey God rather than men. See, here we go. This is the, this is the whole issue of today. We either obey men and the, the, the doctrines and the teachings of men or the doctrine and teachings of Jesus Christ. It's one or the other. You can't have it both ways. Some people say they want it both ways. You can't have it both ways here. Jesus said, he who is not with me is against me. So if we're with him, we're looking for that glorious return. We're looking for heaven to come down and bless our soul as it's doing today. We have to realize Matthew chapter 15, verse 9, Jesus said he talks to those who are professing to worship him. I don't want anybody to think, oh, we're too hard and we're trying to judgmental of this group, that group, and nothing right here. The Bible cuts it right down what it is. The Bible said, Jesus said, this is my people and here's what my people will be doing. If you're not doing that, then we're not his people. Amen. Profess all we want. Well, we're teaching this here. It seems it's close enough. That's not what the Bible said. You think Jesus would say, I want you to obey me and then say, do it any way you want? That wouldn't be much of a test, would it? Jesus said to the professed Christian, in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. If it's not a commandment of God, then it's a commandment of men, and Jesus said it's in vain. 
That's why we think these messages are important. The Word of God is important. Don't be fooled. Don't be deceived. One of the most famous illusionists is David Copperfield. Anyone heard of him? Yeah, well, some of you heard more of that. Sound like you heard of the Word of God. What's going on? Pretty positive response. Not that it's wrong. You see what? I mean, the world is crazy for him. They love what he does. Interesting. In fact, in front of a live crowd. See, I don't. I can't explain this. In front of a live crowd, David Copperfield. He's made a jet plane disappear on the runway. That sounds impossible to me. Remember, he's an illusionist. How he does and why, I guess, is why he makes so much money. It seemed like it disappeared. The people standing there thought it disappeared. Huh. On another occasion, he made the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor seem to disappear. People who were standing there looking at it, something changed, something happened, and they said, Oh, it's gone. It wasn't gone, but they thought it was gone. They didn't see it anymore. How might this be illustrated in what we're talking about that the enemy is what he's doing here in these last days, making things appear different than they really are? Huh. Think about it. He, he created you know, not just an illusion that we talked about here, but a complete deception. That's what the enemy does. And the biggest deception that's ever hit this planet is just about to be pulled off right now. We can warn the world about it. But you realize this subject, as simple as it is, maybe not quite so much, 7 billion people on the planet, probably 6.5 billion are fooled on this subject. Or don't care at all about it. Think of the other beliefs and different things around the world. That just leaves a little handful. And the part of that handful, half of them don't believe it. Then you got the little remnant and half of them's not going to listen to it. That means there will be very few that will not be fooled. Because the Bible says the, dece the devil deceived the whole world. Hmm. Just a little small group that he was not able to get to because... They were the elect. That simply means they weren't better than anybody else. That means they studied the Word of God and they knew the difference. And as you study the Word of God, you're going to know the enemy, how he attacks. You should know in advance what he's getting ready to do. I tell my wife sometimes, oh, don't say the words, whatever it might be. You know, talking about something the devil might try to pull on you sometimes. I don't even say it out loud. None of you have done that. All right. Don't say, you know why he has ears to hear. He, less, he, he listens much better sometimes than church members. He knows exactly what's going on. Biggest attempt ever. He's going to appear as Jesus Christ, is he not? That's what the Bible talks about. Talks about the war in heaven, him being cast out. He came down here, deceived Adam and Eve. He thinks the world is his, and he's going to set, right, set up shop here. Jesus came and won the world back. Praise God, gave us a second chance. I'm very thankful and grateful for that. The enemy just simply said what the world says today. You can't obey God. See? Most people, if you believe in keeping all the commandments of God, the other churches, they feel sorry for you. They kind of stick out their hands. You're in bondage. Not at all. Perfect liberty. Perfect freedom in Christ. Because you can put your head on your pillow at night knowing you have not willfully broken one of God's commandments. That means there's going to be a lot of growth and things. But not willfully have you done this thing. That's quite, that's quite a piece, isn't it? That the world just can't have. People are listening to the enemy today. We've often said, for every genuine truth, there's a what? Remember, every what? This is good keeping our mind all the time. We might hear, but for every truth there is in the Word of God, the devil has a counterfeit for it. I don't care what it is. 
If it's love, he has a counterfeit for love. If there's a, a peace, just peace in the life, the devil has a counterfeit peace. He tells people, if you want peace in your life, do this and do this. It won't bring peace. He's got a counterfeit for joy and happiness. Whatever it might be, he has it. He can't stand God, and he doesn't like you and me if we're a follower of Jesus Christ. But praise God, right? We have the protection of all of heaven, or none of us would be here today. Think about it. You are a blessed people. You can get up and go about your business, go on through right here, and the devil's just, who, 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 if I could just get to them. There's that hedge around that Job had. You remember? When you walk in the name of Jesus Christ, there's a hedge around you that the devil's outside trying to break it down. He's trying to cut it down. I don't know who gave me that handsaw, but thank you. <laughs> Thought I'd bring that in while I... Somebody gave me a nice, very big old handsaw here. I guess I was talking about when I was talking about when I was, you know, a little bit naughty at home and Mom said, go cut me a switch. I'd, I'd take a handsaw and go cut her a club. So she could beat me to death with it. I was a smart aleck. <laughs> like a nice big handsaw, an older one, you know, I'm nothing. They might have been telling me I need to go cut a switch for myself. I don't know. But thank you, how sweet. But the enemy's trying to get in, so he's trying to cut that hedge down. If I can just get in one little way to distract Brother Doug, if I can just get a little bit, you know, sub, you know, get sidetracked a little bit where I can get Sister Mary. See, that's all I need is a little entering wedge, and then, you know, with those you cut trees and split logs, right? You get that, that wedge, that big wedge, and you put it in just a little slit right there, and you hit it, and man, it just cracks it right on open. Hmm. That's all he needs is just a little wedge. He just needs to watch how you react when you see something. Watch how you react when you hear something. And he says, aha, don't think he's not watching. We need to be aware of that so that we may gain the victory. This old enemy, I'm telling you, I'm thankful one day soon there's going to be an end to the old enemy. He's going to be ashes under our feet. Think about it. Sin will not rise up again the second time again when Jesus comes. We won't have to worry about this mess anymore. We're going to be on a, just a lifetime, eons of time vacation. Woo. You don't have to have a checkbook or a credit card. You don't have to have anything. It's all free. Well, I'm going to go get in line. Well, usually if there's free things in here, we go get in line, right, hon? Sometimes. Of course, the world lies. They say it's free, but you have to pay for it somehow. But God doesn't lie. He said it's all free, but... You've got to come on up and collect it. Conflict between good and evil goes on and on. The prize that the devil wants is what? He wants this world, and he wants you, and he wants me. Think about it. That's the prize is you. It's me. And I'm asking God that I don't want to be his little prize. I don't want to be his pride. I don't want to be owned by the, by the enemy. Satan will masquerade as Christ, 2 Corinthians talks about. We won't read that because of our time, 11, 13 through 15. The book of Matthew, we won't go into all those because of our time. Well, we spend a lot of time in the baptismal water, and that's all right with me because I don't have to stare and preach all the time because better things were happening. That we know the book of Matthew says there's false Christ, false prophets going to rise. It says that. If it's possible, we're going to deceive the very elect. We understand that. It's also say a false Christ is going to come, and they said if he's, if he's in the desert, what? Go not forth. If he's in the secret chambers, do what? Go not forth. Do you realize how tempting that would be? How tempting that would be? Because there will be a creature that will show up, that will be nothing this world has ever seen. And he's going to, we won't, maybe the voice of the shepherd, but he's going to talk and sound like Jesus. But you'll always catch him because he is a liar and the truth's not in him. Let him talk for a minute, he's going to, he's going to end up lying because he keeps the father lies. 
But he's going to work signs and miracles and wonders. But praise God, we serve such a God in heaven that he said, you may do that to the saints and test them, but you're not going to come down from heaven like I am. That's a sure sign right there, isn't it? So if someone shows up on this planet, don't just say, well, you know, I was curious and I... Curiosity killed the cat. You can't afford to dilly-dally with the devil because you know it's the devil already. Eve dallied around the tree just for a few seconds. The world was gone. You cannot do that at... I'm just throwing something out here. I don't know. But you know what? He's going to think, well, because he knows the Bible. The devil is a Bible student. you know that? Yes, he is. He, know, he knows prophecy. He knows it better than we know it. Well, that's sad to say. But he knows it because he's had to have a plan. For everything God's getting ready to do, he wants to do something before God does it. Whether it's the latter rain we're talking about, you know, all this kind of stuff, or whether it's Jesus coming in the clouds of glory, he's going to try to beat him to the draw. Because he said, if I beat him to the draw, then the majority of the world will believe. The world is ripe right now because of the false teaching on the secret rapture. The world is ripe. They're greased up for it. They're ready to accept it right now. They're believing it's about to happen. They're looking at the thousand-year millennium as we're peace on this earth. They're looking at, oh, Jesus is about to come. But they do not know because they've not been taught. They think it's going to be a secret thing, and the Bible teaches just the opposite. How can we be so blind? How can we be blind when scriptures are so plain on this subject? If this dazzling, bright being that's performing miracles and doing things that you and I can look at and get up as close as we want. We can't tell the difference. Everybody around will be falling on their knees and say, this is Jesus Christ, this is the Messiah. You may be the only one that's an oddball. And you may not. You may be shocked. Say, I can't explain this, man. I'm going to go along with it. No. When Jesus comes a second time, his feet will what? will not touch this earth. Now remember, you know it, you may have been through it, but there's somebody sitting here and then the voice later on will watch or listen to, they have never heard this before in their life. Let's take it as though this is what we're talking about. When Jesus comes back the second time, his feet will not touch this earth. So anybody's feet that's touching the earth, I don't care if the devil puts himself up about six inches and floats across, he still ain't Jesus. Are you still with me? He, he's, a, he's a floater. I don't have any use for any floaters. You know what I mean? He's going to do things to say, oh, well, I, I know what it says. It says his feet won't touch. You notice my feet are not touching. You know what I'm saying? What kind of art that we as human beings go for? Oh, oh, I see. No. Jesus said when he comes, he said, every eye is going to see me. And then all you doubting Thomas says, I, whew. Well, how is that possible on a round? Have you... <laughs> Haven't you heard it? See, hum, human ideas. Get rid of the human. We're talking about the king of the universe. When he says every eye is going to see him, I don't care if it is round. I don't care if it's oblong. I don't care what it is. When he says every eye will see, you better believe every eye is going to see him. And at the same time, we don't have to wait a few hours till the sun comes up. He has ways. He's God. Heaven is so big and so populated. The universe, millions upon billions and trillions. Here we got the little old planet that's, just, what, 25,000 miles around it. If you look and study just a little bit, and, and people have projected a lot of different things, that, you know, heaven came down and glory filled our soul. We read in the Bible, we're talking about, ooh, oh, it seems that Jesus is going to come from the belt of Orion. You remember? That constellation of Orion. There's something about when he comes through here. The scientists, different people are looking up, and they're, they're looking through these big glasses, and they're looking, they're saying, there's colors up there that we don't see on the planet. There's something coming through that belt, that hole in the sky. Woo! Yes. The Bible talks about, remember, the belt of Orion's being loosed. That simply means as they're studying this, they're looking at the opening, and the opening is going like this. Nothing else up there is doing it. Jesus creates them, puts them up there, and says, stay. 
this one right here, he's going, uh, you know why? You know how, about how far, how wide that is? It's about 300,000 miles across. And that is not big enough to get God and all the glory down here. 300,000 miles. And we're worried about a 25,000 mile little round circle. And it has to expand before heaven comes down. And if you kind of look at it and study it a little bit, uh, some people have projected that heaven, that heaven is about three, uh, 300 million where, where, where God is. I'm just throwing it out to you. I don't find that in the Bible. 300 million light years away from us. Now, I can't get all that stuff. I'm with two and two and four plus four. But it's big. 300 million light years. Light travels 186,000 miles a second. Should I back up and say that and you're going to believe me? 186,000 miles a second. And heaven may be where God dwells is over 300 million light years. It, it, this is what heaven is. It's too big for us. Our minds just can't wrap around it. That's why we need the simple faith as a child and just say, that's what God says. He's capable of coming down. He's capable of just a little thing like every eye shall see him. And the song so beautifully put, when Jesus comes, because it's, it's a literal, it's a literal coming. He's really coming after me. He's really coming after you. He doesn't want to miss it. That's what all he gave up. He gave up for you and for me. And you'll never understand it, and I'll never understand it. Through the ceaseless ages, I'll never understand why he did what he did for somebody like me. I cannot get it through my head. And you'll never understand, and we'll just begin to taste one of these days, by God's grace, we're in the kingdom. And you see where he was and what he gave up to come down here and what he took on himself. He took on humanity, full humanity. He felt pain. He felt sorrow. He felt loneliness. He felt it all. And when he went back into heaven, he went back in flesh and bone. He'd no longer be a spirit. He can't be every place at once anymore because he gave it up so he could so relate to you and to me to be my savior. The universe, that's what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about, those big numbers, that's not even a little poof in a spittoon, right? Can, whatever it is. It's nothing compared to the universe. There is no end. It goes on and on and on. And God is aware of everything and everybody. It's going on. It's an awesome. Don't doubt him. Don't doubt him. He can do anything. He said, I'm coming back. And want to be ready. I know you want to be ready. But it's who you worship. Let's boil it down. Because you know what? I could talk on this a long time. Well, we got half sad, half happy. <laughs> I mean, really, really, please think about it. If this is really that glorious return, and it's for real. Man, I want to hear it. Somebody sing it to me. Somebody preach it to me. Somebody talk to me about it. Somebody tell me about Jesus. Tell me about the one that made it possible. I need to hear it because it changes my thinking. It changes my life. It changes my heart. I can't be the same and be in the presence of Jesus. But when the enemy shows up, you know how he might do it? Because he knows it's going to be, it says every eye shall see him. And of course the way technology and all is, and even with 3ABN, what? Less than a half a second the signal goes around the world. What if he had a big hookup with the satellite companies and so on, and he's going to, ooh, and he's going to, go, he's going to come on it. I'm just throwing this out. <laughs> be no shoes thrown up here. 7 p.m. Arizona time. The enemy's going to show up around the world. 
But they'll say Jesus is going to show up around the world. Because it's kind of interesting because it said when he goes, when it goes to the secret chambers, the confines maybe of one's home, where they have the TV sets, the satellite dishes, don't turn it on. It's possible. You see what I'm talking about here. He could make an appearance and say, this is what I was talking about. And because he's dazzling and powerful and bright and working miracles, you'll say, oh, I, oh okay, I, I didn't get that part. Just food for thought. Everything you can possibly think about how he's going to try to mess everything up, think about it, or simply do this. Focus on the real McCoy. Focus upon what Jesus says is going to happen. It's all who you worship. Our message in Revelation 14, 7, the, he worshiped the one that made heavens and earth, Revelation 14, 9. If any man worship the beast, what is it boiling down to? Who you give your allegiance to. But notice the enemy deceived in Revelation 19, 20. I know I'm not given time to put it up there probably, but Revelation 19, 20, it talks about the enemy, which deceiveth them that receive the mark of the beast and them that worship his image. We're going to have to deal with the mark of the beast. We're going to have to deal with the image to the beast. And we can't be so easily offended every time somebody says something to us because this is our commission. This is our job to warn about the true Seventh-day Sabbath and a false day that's out there. Are you? Hello. See, it's not tasteful sometimes to us as Christians, but, you know, ask God to help us to be tasteful. He put it in the word for a reason, did he not? He said, because those who don't know my day and not willing to keep my day, they're going to worship the beast power. And those who worship the beast receive the mark of the beast. They're not going to be saved. And so God says, somebody needs to warn them because we're so bad off spiritually in the world. Does that make sense? See, my point is, don't raise your hand. Who's here willing to do that? Your wife may get on to you, your husband may get on to you, the church may say no. About to say an awful lot of stuff, I have to stop and get off the box for a minute. Sometimes it's those of our own household that cause us the most difficulties. Those who should be standing shoulder to shoulder with us are the ones trying to slow things down a little bit or saying, don't do it. I heard a guy tell me not too long ago, don't be talking about all that stuff. You're going to bring about a time of persecution. I mean, it, it, I hear somebody say, bring it on, get it over with. I don't want persecution either, but you know what? It's going to have to come. You know, I don't see myself as a martyr, but I guarantee you this, if God so chooses that I be his martyr, he will give me exactly what I need at that point in time, and I'll go out singing in the flames. Are you still with me? If God sees fit, think about it. If he sees fit, he'll give you what you need at that time. Don't start and say, well, I don't want to be. How do you think we're going to get out of here? Jesus said, you're going to have to walk the way that I walked. Peter said, bring it on. And then he was a sniveling sissy. Before it was over. Did you get? I don't want you to forget that. Before he was converted, he was. He denied Jesus Christ. He wasn't the man he thought he was. He didn't have the you know, commitment that he thought he had. And then when the pressure was really applied, he folded. But after that, only a look from Jesus after what broke his heart. Jesus didn't say, oh, Peter, I wish you hadn't have done that. Man, you made a mess of the ministry. You made a mess of this. You made a mess of He didn't say he just looked at him. And I think that look was saying, I still love you. You know what you've done. I knew what you'd do when you said, not me, Master. We need to be careful today. If God so chooses, then we will be such and such if God so chooses. Who do you worship today? Who do I worship today? Revelation 13, 8 says, all the, word, all the world worships the beast. Friends, why does it have to be that way? I've said that from just a young man. Why does it have to be that almost all the world will worship the beast in his image? Because the devil has so deceived the whole world. Religious institutions, your TV evangelist and all this business going on. They're out there, many, many corrupting the world. They're not teaching the truth, they're corrupting 
Call it like it is. You know why? When you do, then you're going to bring on persecution. You're, that's called the straight testimony. If we're not willing to live with a straight testimony and preach a straight testimony, we need to go find some other place. Whew. Anybody's ears read yet? That doesn't necessarily mean you and I'm talking about. We're talking about here as we brothers and sisters in Christ. There's something's wrong. There's something wrong. Oh, we're doing a good job right here. The world's not mad at us as Seventh-day Adventists, really. That just tells me we haven't, Brother Danny, we haven't done it. And I'm not, I'm not trying to criticize that. I found myself as a, as a failure. I haven't done everything I should have done, and I regret not doing it. And so you have to redeem the time. You have to hang in there. And don't worry about the look on a man's face. You do what God sent you here. He sent us here to do some business. He sent us here to give a message to your brothers and your sisters because if they do not receive this three angels' message, they will die in their sins. There will not be another message given. This is the last day message that will warn and perfect the people to meet Jesus when he shall come in the clouds of glory. You don't want to miss that. And that's not trying to be selfish. No, we've got all this and that. This is a fact of the Bible. It's the everlasting gospel is what it says. To be preaching to every nation, kindred, tongue. As a test, then the world's going to come. Why? Because the world has turned on our creator. They've turned on the day that he set aside. He says the seal of God and give us the false day of worship. And the world's went crazy over it. We have to be willing to stand. And I'm not trying to offend anybody here that believes differently. But Sunday's not the seventh day. Sunday's the first day. He came out right out of the grave. Praise God for the first day. But it's a common working day. It was never blessed. It was never sanctified. It was never set apart for holy use. But the seventh day is, was, and will always be through eternity. This is what we have to look at. I'm, tr I'm serious with you. Don't think it's so painful and so hard to get this thing. That we should have been doing this a long time ago instead of, say, crawling in bed with the other people. Was that too much? Rubbing footsies with other people. When I'm rubbing footsies, it's because I'm wanting to share the good news of Jesus Christ. There's a difference in moving in. Are you still with me? We have to be careful that we get so caught up in the things of the world that we become just like the world and we find ourselves in difficult situations that's hard to give the real truth of the message because we have so many close friends that you know they love Jesus, at least you think in your heart, but they're not following truth at all. And you say... You know, would you like a Bible study? Well, no, we don't need it. No, we don't want to know. Well, doesn't that separate the ones who are true and those who are not? Walk the way that Jesus walked? A real, true, honest Christian, someone says, can you study the Bible? Say, yes. Yes. Let's study. Let's see what it says. You know why? Because where I'm in error, I want to know the truth. I wouldn't care to go to church on Wednesday if that's what the Bible said. Now think about it. As it were, people say, well, this is what you do. I don't get paid to say go to church on Saturday. Hello, anybody catch? There's some who will say that maybe because that's, they get a paycheck for it. And I've said to a few of them, go out and get you a real job. I know it kind of sounds humorous, but really that's the truth because if we're not serious about the cause of God, we're we causing all kind of trouble and all kind of division among us because, well, this church says we can do this. This church says it's okay to do that. Well, the pastor said it's okay. I don't care what the pastor said. It's what the Bible says. That doesn't mean I don't have respect and love for it. I, you know what I'm talking about here. Bottom boiled down right on the surface, right on the heart. What does God say in his word? That's what the church board stands for. That's what the church does because God says it in his word. You make no exceptions for that. You don't bend it over and try something else. Well, because, well, somebody will get offended and they're going to leave. Remember what? It, by, if they don't love the truth by and by, they're going to become offended anyway and they're going to leave anyway. But if they're going to stay in, they're going to cause nothing but trouble. I'm telling you, we've got to be converted as a church. Jesus said this, Acts 1, 11, this same Jesus which was taken up. I'm winding it down. Whoo, I'm telling you, I don't. Bible said when Jesus comes, he's not going to sneak around like the dirty devil who's a sneak. 
he's going to try to catch us unawares, you know. The Bible, my Bible talks about here when he comes, that there's going to be trumpet blast. Whoo. Did we hear the song a while ago? When Jesus comes, he's going to blow a great big old trumpet. It says it's going to pierce the ears of the dead. Now, that's pretty noisy. I don't know how you can get the attention of the dead. I couldn't do it by blowing no trumpet. I blow it till my brains came out, and I still wouldn't. You know what I'm talking about here. There's something about letting us know that when he comes, there's going to be a trumpet blast, and there's going to be bodies popping out of the ground like popcorn. Yes, all over the place. Here they go, around the world. It's not going to be, well, in America, we're going to get it, and then we'll go to an island, and we'll get it right here. We need to be careful because all those islands, when Jesus comes, those islands, many of them are going to disappear. That's what it says. That lets you know right then and there the true Christ is when the dead in Christ rise first. We which are alive and remain is going to be taking a little bit of travel. We're going to be caught up to meet him in the air because his feet will not touch the ground. Think how wonderful, how simple that is. It's noisy. Mountains gone. Woo! Yeah, earthquakes, absolutely. Think how powerful God is. At the sound of his voice, he can crumble a, crumble a mountain. When he lit on Mount Sinai there, he'll give him the Ten Commandments. He burnt the top right off of it. Well, some of you are not going to get that. There are actually those who have told us they go up there and there's places, evidence, that are just, it, it's burnt black on the top. Well, he could have destroyed it if he wanted to, but he didn't. That's his holy presence. And the holy presence, when he comes after supposedly a holy people, and if we're not a holy people when he comes, the Bible says what's going to happen to the wicked. They're going to be struck dead by the brightness of his coming. We cannot stand in the presence of a holy God. That's why when sin came, God said, I can't walk with you anymore, Adam and Eve, in the garden. Because you can't look on my face and live, and I don't want you to hurt. I want you to have another chance. We need some fire protection on Jesus Christ. Oh, robe of righteousness. When he comes, he's coming to take us home. You ever heard anybody preach about the third coming? Hello? Yeah. Shouldn't we? Absolutely. He came the first time. What did he do? He walked this earth. He lived the perfect life, right? He said, now I'm coming back. The dead in Christ rise first. My, I'm not touching the ground, right? Second coming, right? Remember the wicked are struck dead by the brightness. We don't have time to go on to it. We talk about two in the field. All Somebody needs to get real when they bring these kind of passages up, if you don't mind me saying. Oh, they say there's two in the field. One's going to be taken. The other remains. This is a secret. It didn't say what happened. The other one will be taken because one of them will be righteous, ready to go. The other one's going to be struck dead by the brightness of his coming. It's not a second chance theory. Remember, two in the bed, one taking the other. Nothing, nothing, nothing truthful about that at all. Well, maybe I shouldn't get involved in all that. The manner of his coming. Hmm. Wouldn't we agree today, before we close, wouldn't we agree that the main thing is to be ready? I mean, that, that, that's very simple. It couldn't get any simpler than that. I, I just, I want to be ready for, for Jesus to come. Amen. Amen. Because really, heaven would be a lonely place, right? If you're just there by yourself, basically. We're here as missionaries, aren't we? Our job is to evangelize. When the church loses that vision, you've lost everything. When you have more work internally than you do externally, you've lost it. Somebody needs to listen. I don't know why I said it. I think there's a reason. I'm not just saying here, but that happens. Why? Because, you know, we, these thought things are good things within themselves. But look, what is our mission? What are we to be doing? We need to think about we want Jesus to come. How much time do we spend internally and how much time do we spend externally? When it says, take this gospel to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. It said, go out and beat the bushes. 
highways and byways to compel them to come in. This may be where it's at. And certainly all can be done, but we need to make sure that we're warning our neighbors and our friends, next door neighbors right here, next door neighbor right next door to you, maybe doesn't even know you go on Saturday or Bible believer. One day soon, we're going to be able to put on immortality. Ooh, this mortal shall put on immortality. That means we're not going to ever die. We're going to live forever with Jesus. Woo, a glorious new immortal body. And I long for that. I'm tired of this old body. Huh. Men and women. Sometimes we cling to things that need to be let go. And today I still appeal with you before we close. Let those things go. They're, they're not worth it. When Christ comes, my brothers and sisters. Last time I have, that I know that my wife will ha have the opportunity to address you as, as a group this side of heaven. Because we may never meet again. Maybe tonight, maybe whatever. But other than that, we may never meet this side of heaven. And I'd sure like for it to come to pass that God would bring it to our remembrance. I remember being there. Amen. I remember the precious saints. I remember those that were so good to us. I remember those who came up. I remember those who made stand for baptism. Jesus' coming is literal. It's personal. It's visible. It's audible. It's glorious. It's climatic. It's decisive. Just don't be fooled. Don't be fooled. He's coming. He's coming soon. Our prayer for you, you remain faithful to God. Don't let anyone take your crown. Another man is not worth it. Another woman is not worth taking your crown. Listen to me, church. Nothing in this world is worth losing your crown. Stay faithful to Jesus. He'll give you a whole lot more. And you'll be happy, not only in this life, but in the life to come. Can we make that commitment as my wife comes up and has closing prayer with us? That commitment by the grace of God. I want to be ready when Jesus comes. Our treasures grow dim while I'm waiting for him. Lord, keep me until Jesus comes. My prayer for this church is, Lord, keep you until Jesus comes. Lord, keep me until Jesus comes. And maybe one of these days, by the grace of God, we remain faithful. We can be reunited together as brothers and sisters in Christ as we stand around that throne. Mm -hmm. We stand around right with Jesus. How wonderful that will be. As we taste that tree of life. Yes. As we walk down that street of gold. Yes. As we hear the angels sing mm -hmm. and we join in with them, we'll be able to sing. We'll have harps. We'll Ooh, be able to play that'll music. That'll be nice. Yeah. Amen. Yes. Amen. Shall we pray, honey? Absolutely. All right. God knows your hearts. He knows the hands raised, the heart that's raised. And he said, I will give you the desires of your heart. Remember, if you miss heaven, it's because you chose to miss heaven. That's, that's what it boils down to. If you want heaven to be your home, God wants it to be your home. It will be your home. Yes. I look forward to seeing you there if, never, if ever again. God bless you. Let's pray. Most gracious Heavenly Father, mm -hmm. as we kneel for perhaps for yes. the very last time in the Chandler Seventh-day Adventist Church here yes. in Arizona. Oh, Father God, you have walked in amongst us. You have answered our prayers. Amen. You have moved upon those who were willing to allow you in. Yes. And Father, I pray that as we've talked about the second coming, as we've seen glimpses mm. of heaven today, yes. that the dross that we're holding on to, the things that we're holding on to, the things in mm. your word you said you, we've got to let go. Yes, please. You've got to let yes. go because if we don't let go, uh -oh. it will be burned off. Yes. Oh, Father, make it real. Amen. Touch the hearts in a way that none of us can touch. We can say the right things. We can read the right words. Mm -hmm. But without your convicting power, it means nothing. Yes. Father, again, may the Chandler 
church be on fire. Amen. Have a heavenly fire Amen. for God. We give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor today. In Jesus' name, church. Amen. Amen.